Hello Sim Racers and welcome to tonight's live stream. Tonight we are going to find out why placing the engine right behind the rear wheels is a terrible idea. And then we're gonna find out why placing the engine behind the rear wheels is a fantastic idea. Uh, we're gonna do lots of question and answering, we're gonna do some theory, we're hopefully gonna do some decent driving, and we're gonna fail many, many times. But, first of all, thank you so much. The channel is 11,000 subscriptions, it's growing day by day, so thank you so much for all the support. As usual, press the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and uh, again, what can we say? So. Let's go into it, but first of all, the news. I want to show you some very, very nice news. Let me know in uh, the chat if everything is fine. All right. Excellent. So, let's start with the news. So, I want to show you a great article by Sports Car Sports Cars 365, a very, very important uh, website about uh, all GT racing. Uh, let me show you now, you should be able to watch it now, all right, okay, <laughs> all right, so first of all, as I said, uh, the news, um, so, um, Sportscar365.com has a small interview by Stefan Rotel. Stefan Rotel, who is Stefan Rotel? Stefan Rotel is the founder and CEO of the SRO organization, Stefan Rotel organization, SRO. Uh, and uh, it is obviously the series that we are doing. So what he said, he said that uh, eSports activation is an extraordinary opportunity he goes on describing and saying that um, Assetto Corsa Competizione was used for the official licensing that we acquired from uh, SRO. Uh, and he thanks uh, everybody because they got a very, very useful exposure uh, during the pandemic lockdown. Uh, while, you know, no real world uh, motorsport was taking place. Etc., etc., etc. Uh, but my new attraction to esports really came with our latest licenses with the Santa Cosa Competition and the extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinarily, yes, uh, realistic features of this game. Um, we took opportunity of the coronavirus situation to embark on and push forward the SRO esports GT series, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Motorsport has been one of uh, the main beneficiaries of the spike in virtual sports interest during the pandemic, mainly because of how faithfully its well-developed sim titles like iRacing, Air Factor 2, and Assetto Corsa Competizione can recreate real-world races. I will also add the Race Room and Assetto Corsa 1, uh, as well as Automobilista and everybody else. Etc., um, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, very important for us going forward. Um, and he concludes by saying, I think it's a great change for motorsport and it's not a threat, a threat said Rattel. Uh, motorsport is expensive, we all know that. It's always has been expensive. You need a team, tires, car, every other thing. Uh, sim racing, you know, it's still expensive a little bit, but nothing like real, real motorsport, of course. And it can bring millions of people to motorsport. So, I would like to thank, personally, Stefan Rattel, which I had the opportunity to meet in uh, when we visited many of the races last year. Uh, he's doing an amazing job with the SRO uh, and the GT3 uh, series and GT4 series and all the other series that SRO is promoting and organizing. Uh, but most importantly, I would like to thank uh, all the communities, the legal organizers, the commentators, all those, those those people that have you know pushed forward sim racing for more than a decade, almost two decades now. Uh, they've been organizing, they've been pushing forward our hobby, uh, and when the opportunity came, 
they were ready. The sim racers, the organizers, uh, the commentators, everything was like a well-oiled engine, and we showed the to, to the real motorsport people what we are able to do when we work all together. So big thank you to all of you guys for uh, all the support that you've been giving to this wonderful hobby. And uh, I hope that, you know, real motorsport will start looking to us in a different way uh, in the following years. All right, so that's it. Now, what are we going to do uh, today? So today, uh, I don't have any, any circuit to, to train because there are no um, leagues that I follow right now. And I had also lots of work to do uh, on the actual sim, console release, um, GT4, DLC, all that stuff. Um, so um, what we, we are going to do, I've posted a poll into the community page of, the, of my YouTube channel and all you guys, uh, pretty much all of you, uh, have, the, have um, asked for you know, some setup for a car. And since it's been a long time that you've been asking to work a little bit on the Porsche, tonight we're going to work a little bit on the Porsche and try to make it better. Uh, we're gonna. I'm, I'm, I will try to show you how to understand if the car has a problem or if the driver has a problem, uh, and uh, all that stuff. I'm pretty sure we're gonna fail very hard because it's been months that I haven't been driving this car uh, competitively. So it's not an easy car. It's probably one of the most difficult cars. Uh, very very satisfying car, but also very very difficult car to push to the limit needs and asks a lot of work from the driver and so on. So, all right, that's what we are going to do uh, tonight. Uh, let me see on the chat if everything is going properly. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, everybody wants to ban Tortellini. Uh, all right. Hersto George, the twerk mobile, <laughs> nice, <laughs> yes, and Petro. Quando avrà la sata GT4? Presto, soon. GT4, soon. <laughs> Tommaso, I'm not here to do support, guys. We have a full forum for support, so if you have some question about the server full, I don't know what to tell you. You should go on the support forum. <laughs> All right. So before we start, let me start with uh, did you know? So I would like to do the whole thing at Zandvoort. And I've chosen a nice late uh, time at 9 o'clock in the evening. But I wanted to tell you something first. So did you know that um, the movement of the sun in a Seto Corsa Competizione follows the sun path and uh, day, time and duration of the race when the race, uh, you know, took place in the calendar, in the real calendar in 2019, for example. So if we go at Zandvoort at nine o'clock uh, in, in the evening, all right, uh, so in, in late evening, because uh, Zandvoort was held during July, there's still light, okay? At nine o'clock in the evening, as you can see, we can have a very fast driving, and you can see there's still light, of course, very long uh, shadows and everything, but the sun is still up into the horizon. Okay? Nice. But, if you let the time of the day at nine o'clock and you go for example at barcelona all right now barcelona was held uh, at uh, september and of course at september the day is shorter the days are shorter so if you go at nine o'clock at barcelona and you load the game here we are it's almost night it's practically night and that's because, as we said, Zandvoort was on 
July and on July 9 o'clock the day was very long while Barcelona was held on September at the 9 o'clock at September is uh, already night and we do that because then uh, obviously the sun is at the correct place and the shadows on the circuit are in the correct place when you are racing on the specific circuit uh, on the specific uh, time of the day. So now you know why there is this difference. Okay. Right, so let's go back. <laughs> uh, and uh, I would like to do some laps of Zandvoort tonight. Why Zandvoort? Well, first of all, it's been a long time that I haven't driven anything at all at Zandvoort. It's a very nice track. Uh, it's now, uh, you know, history, uh, historic track because they changed it. So it's probably the last and most modern implementation of this circuit in any sim. Um, so let's try Zandvoort. And because it has some uh, very long terms of various speeds. So we have long 180 degrees turns, as you can see here, um, in second gear, another one in probably first gear. We have a very long turn here in fourth gear, uh, another long uh, in third gear, another one in fourth or fifth gear. So very long uh, turns uh, with pretty much constant radius uh, in various gears. And why we need this? I want to show you some stuff about how the car reacts and how you can understand uh, if there is a problem with the car or if there's a problem with your driving style. Uh, and I think this is going to be really helpful. Um, so uh, let's try this. Let's go in. So Zandvoort, I chosen this wonderful, wonderful golf uh, library of the Porsche 991 2.2 <laughs> GT3 R, uh, which is the most uh, new car. Well, as you know, the Porsche has its engine after its rear wheel, so all the weight is here. But another thing that it is very, very important on the Porsches, because by the rules, the cars have to maintain their fuel tank at the same place as you know the real car, the street car. Uh, the Porsches have their fuel tank here to the front. So you, you have the rear engine right here, lots of weight at the rear, and you have 120 liters, you know, almost 100 kilos of fuel load at the front, behind the front wheels, which means that uh, depending on how much fuel you have, the whole weight balance of the car changes a lot, a lot. Uh, so this is something to, you know, Keep in mind, uh, and we're going to, <clears throat> sorry about that, we're going to talk about this uh, later uh, while we're trying the, the car. <clears throat> ah, yes, the headlights. The headlights are wonderful. Boom. Ah, look at that. Amazing. And the indicators. <laughs> look at the indicators. I mean, come on, guys. This, this is a great car. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, as usual, lots of detail inside as per Kunos. I, I mean, honestly, I think we have the best interiors of any sim out there. I mean, the, the level of detail is absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, modesty apart, we know how to do interiors. <laughs> All right, so congrats to our uh, 3D artists and modelers and uh, texture people. All right. So let's start. Let's go in. I don't know about future plans, guys. Don't don't ask me about future plans. All right. So, first thing first. Um, as usual, I start with uh, the um, aggressive setup. So what we're going to do, uh, as usual, is we're gonna choose the aggressive setup. We are going to do some laps. We need at least four to five laps. Uh, I also need to, you know, get up to speed with uh, with the circuit. Uh, and um, 
I also want to, uh, first thing, step number one, prepare the pressures. For whatever driving style we have right now, I'm pretty sure we're not yet uh, very, very good uh, at driving this car on this circuit, but at least the first thing we have to do is do some laps, start to, you know, understand the car a little bit and correct the pressures for the ambient temperature, for uh, the whole circuit and for the car. Because obviously the aggressive setup is always a good point to start, uh, but you have to adjust the pressures every time because the ambient and the track temperature changes uh, depending on whatever weather you have or whatever conditions or whatever day of the uh, time of the day you have. All right, so, um, okay, so some things, uh, a couple of uh, things first for the car. As we said, rear engine, front fuel tank. This is a very, very uh, new project. It's the evolution version of uh, the car. It has, uh, up until the last version, the car has a, a multiple link rear uh, suspension, uh, and it had a McPherson uh, suspension geometry at the front. This Evo version, the 991.2 version, has uh, double wish bones, almost multiple link at the front, and multiple link uh, rear suspension. So it's much more evolved. They've managed somehow to bring uh, the engine some centimeters ahead. I think it's like uh, 10 or 20 millimeters towards the front. So even better. Uh, weight balance. Uh, this is a car that has amazing, amazing uh, mechanical uh, grip. Uh, it is very well balanced in terms of mechanical grip, but still lots of weight at the rear. It wants to rotate a lot. Uh, it has great traction. And the main issue with the car is uh, that it, because the, the engine is at the back, and let me show you what I mean, Okay, so let me show you. So, as we said, the engine is at the rear. Okay, and because of that, as you can see, uh, the rear diffuser is very, very shallow. It doesn't have any real depth. Why? Because, you know, the, the engine is, is, is right there. There is, is no place. Now, this car, as, as we said, is better than, than before. Uh, it's better than the, the old uh, uh, version, so it has a better diffuser. The version before that had, had practically no diffuser at all. But still, it is a very shallow diffuser. It is a very short diffuser. So because of that, it cannot generate big amounts of downforce from uh, the under tray. So that's why, by the rules, it is permitted by this car to have a massive, massive rear wing, which is also placed quite high. Uh, because you have to know that uh, the, the height of the rear wing is, depends on the rules. Uh, usually the rules say the rear wing has to be at least not higher than the roof of the car. Uh, but on some cars, it's even lower than that. Uh, because they are very, very uh, effective and they have a very good aerodynamics over the, the roof of the car. So they limit the height of the rear wing. And because when they lower the rear wing, uh, obviously the wing gets more dirtier and doesn't get much cleaner. So the efficiency of the rear wing gets worse. Uh, but on the Porsche, right, exactly because the diffuser is not so efficient, they let it have a very, very big uh, and very wide rear wing. You can see it's really very wide and it is also quite high in uh, height. This together with a very, very advanced uh, front splitter that we can also adjust in this car, uh, winglets and massive uh, work here. Uh, as, you, as you probably know, uh, those opening, those fairings on top of uh, the um, uh, wheel archers are responsible of creating lots of downforce at the front end. Why? Because when the car goes uh, at, at 
mid to high speed, uh, there is lots of turbulence created uh, inside the wheel archers from the spinning wheels. Uh, that turbulence creates lots of pressure and that pressure creates lift. So by opening the uh, wheel archers at the up uh, at, uh, on top of the wheel archers and also creating this kind of exit of, of the air, uh, not only you get you know, better uh, cool, uh, cool effect for the brakes, for the, for the tires and everything, but you also eliminate all the pressure inside the wheel arts and you create downforce by that way. And of course, uh, you can also uh, create a flow of the air that moves properly. It's much more complicated than what I can explain to you right now at my uh, knowledge in how to create laminar flow are limited, of course. Uh, and they also create less pressure underneath. And so you get even more downforce like that. So this car now has much better front downforce. It has better rear downforce, but still it depends a lot on the rear wing to generate rear downforce. And as such, it means that uh, you have to, you know, usually um, use higher uh, rear wing angles. And this means more drag. That's why this car um, has usually a little bit lower top speed than other cars, because you are forced to use uh, higher rear wing angle. And obviously, higher rear wing angle generates more downforce, but also more drag. There is no other way around it. All right, so let me check on the chat if everything is correct. <laughs> All right. Uh, if I change the angle of the wing, does the 3D model also adjust? Unfortunately, no. It was in the plans, but we didn't manage to do this. So, no, it doesn't, doesn't work like that. Sorry about that. <laughs> totally. How much drug do you want? Porsche. Yes. <laughs> so true. So true. But yes, again, I mean, look at, look at the, the detail of, of our 3D models. I mean, look at that. Right? You can see the, the screws. The screws are modeled. Look at this. This is a Torx. You see? You see that? Ain't that amazing? Yeah. Really, really good. Really good. And of course, I mean, look at this. Look at that, guys. Our modelers are crazy. Crazy guys. Crazy guys. Uh, can Porsche match Ferrari mid-corner speed? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, pretty much, yes. Look at this. So cool. Um, one of the most wonderful things with the Porsche is that if you follow it during the night uh, in a long straight, uh, the, whole, the whole exhaust here becomes incandescent and, go, and glows more and more uh, red. Uh, the, more, the longer the, the straight is and the longer the driver is you know, full throttle, the more red becomes the exhaust and it's full visible. So if you follow... Uh, you know, one of the things, one of the most wonderful things you can do in a Santa Corsa Competizione, uh, follow a Porsche and during the night and turn off your lights. The, the spectacle is amazing because you see it glowing red. And when you go into the braking zone, it starts braking and, you know, goes into the turn. It slowly goes back to, you know, being less, glowing less and less and less. And then it goes to the accelerator again and glows more and more red it's it's pretty cool it's pretty cool so yeah you should do that and maybe we should we could show this later all right so uh let me see everything is good yes we will bring yeti ask if we are going to do uh to show stuff about the aero balance depending on fuel load we will try to show that stuff too yes how do you do free cam mode? You press F7 and then you move around with the mouse and with the arrow keys. And if you cannot move with the arrow keys like this, scroll with the uh, 
middle uh, scroll uh, scroll uh, wheel, uh, scroll forward for faster and scroll backwards for slower. All right? Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's go back. Return to garage. Setup. Aggressive setup. We don't touch anything at all. We are going to do four, five, six laps, even more, if we can, if we can stay on the road. Uh, and um, uh, and then we, we will try to understand some things about the car. Not everything right now. The most important thing right now is to stay on the road, learn a little bit how to adjust our driving style with the car, and then um, take care of the pressures. That's step number one. Step number one, take care of the pressures, always. Okay. One, all right. All right, let's go. Ah, listen to the sound of this thing. Normal aspirated flat six, 9,000 RPM. And because it is a relatively small engine in comparison to the other cars, it's almost, almost non-restricted. So it gives power up to the limiter of 9,000 RPM. Hear the scream, screaming. Listen to that. Old tires, brakes, and everything. Amazing stuff. <laughs> Power. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's amazing. Whoa, moves around so much. But the traction, the traction out of the corners is amazing. Fourth gear. Oh, 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 oh. oh. <laughs> all right, all right. At least I've managed to do one lap and I'm still alive, almost. So as I said before, it's a little bit early to start judging the car right now. For sure, the car moves around a lot. You can see that I'm doing lots of small corrections with the steering wheel. But we knew that this is a characteristic of the Porsche. The Porsche. Sorry. Now, why is that? Well, as we said, there's a lot of um, weight at the rear. And as we have explained many times with the hammer time, uh, it's like a hammer. And it wants to, you know, while, while you're braking, it wants to bring the rear end forward because all the weight is at the back. There is other, also a different characteristic uh, with the Porsche. And uh, the problem is that 
it is the car with the smallest wheelbase of all of them. Now, what that means? Whoa, here, here's what it means. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Code brown. It means that um, because the wheelbase is so short, it really is the shortest wheelbase uh, of all of the cars by a big margin, it is also very agile. It wants to change direction very, very fast. And we can see that in chicanes like this. I mean, look at that. Boom. It's instant, instant change of direction. But exactly because of that, because of the uh, willingness to change direction so fast, it is also a bit unstable uh, while you are trying to, you know, turn into the turn. Uh, or while we, you are coasting uh, into a long, uh, long turn as, as we have here at, uh, at Zandvoort. So, yeah, um, as always with, uh, you know, car handling and uh, characteristics, uh, you have some advantages, but you also have disadvantages. Also, another thing, uh, the narrow wheelbase <clears throat> it generates uh, much bigger weight transfers, especially during acceleration and braking. What it means? It means that uh, actually, let me let me first finish some races, some uh, laps here, and then I will show this uh, to you from the outside because it is important to understand and we need to understand why a short wheelbase generates higher uh, weight transfer. So what are we doing now? 39s. Yeah, it's pretty high. Uh, I think it would be a realistic uh, target for tonight to manage to do something like uh, 36 maybe in race stream as usual 37 32 oh, oh, oh my god <laughs> 36 or 37 something like that i think it's to be realistic let's see if we can push a little bit more I can see the pressures that they are low, very low, which means we have still good margin to improve, which is good. My god, this this car moves so much around. Ah, come on. Whew. Such a difficult car. The sun <laughs> doesn't help. <laughs> it's exactly on the apex of that turn. All right, we are 37, I think. Yeah, 37 low. Not bad. And we are not driving very well right now, so there's plenty to, to gain from driving. Oh my god. Oh, what a car! It's a wild horse. Okay, five laps. I don't think I can make the tires heat up more than that. In the meantime, thank you, Juan de Vries, 
<laughs> and Dennis Jones for following, and Dimitri, and Nick, all the new subscribers. Thank you so much, guys. Oh. All right. Huh. Ooh, what a car. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, so uh, I should have go in, but okay, let's let's stop like this this time because there is so many things I would like to tell you, so let's move on right so first thing fix the pressures so 27.2 we want to stay at 27.5.6 something like that uh, it's not bad but it's better if it's go a little bit higher hello Duki. hi mate how you doing all right so one two three let's let's stay at three and here we have 26.9 oh that's very low all right, so um, one and one, two, three, four, five. And 26.9 again, so one and one, two, three, four, five. Again, for the people that do not remember, you do at least four or five laps, you check your last readings here, and you try to make that PSI hot while you're driving to be at around 27.5, 27.6, the good range is from 27.4 to 28, something like that. So stay somewhere around there. And um, to do so, you get then your cold pressures and you raise them by the number of clicks, you know, of point uh, value that you want the hot pressure to be. So, for example, here, okay, we are at 26.6. And we want this to become 27.5, which means that we need uh, nine clicks. Okay, nine clicks. We need this from 26.6 to become 27.5, which means we need 0 0.9 more. So you go on the cold one. You don't care what it says here. It's just the cold pressure. You just go nine clicks more. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The end pressure is 26.2, doesn't matter, you don't care about that. You want, you know that you did nine clicks, which means that when we go out and drive again at the same conditions, this pressure will become 27.5, okay? So, um, why is this important? It is very important. The pressure is the most important thing to have grip out of your tire because the pressure is what sustains the skeleton of the uh, of, of your tire and gives the maximum footprint of your tire to touch the asphalt now the temperature could be a little bit lower than ideal or a little bit higher than ideal it happens you cannot do much about the temperature the temperature is what it is you can raise it by five degrees or lower it by five degrees and a little, a, little, a little bit more by changing your driving style, but you cannot do miracles with the temperature. So the most important thing you can change is the pressure. Always first thing to do, change the pressures. And you do this the first time, you change some stuff, you, you drive again, you change some stuff maybe on the um, car because you know you want to change it to be the car you go out you drive again and you control the pressures back again okay all right so um okay okay let me check if at the um at the chat everything is okay so sebastian brunier says 911 has different tire size from the rear yes indeed does optimum pressures differ as well no not really not really uh, usually, I mean, Pirelli says, you know, the optimum pressure is always the same on all the, th practically they have 
three different uh, tire sizes for the cars. Uh, nowadays, for 2019, with the new Porsche, they have just two. Uh, so it's uh, 325, 680 for the front and 325, 705 for the rear. And for the cars that have front engine, they are the same 705 front and rear. So that's it, practically. Uh, but the pressure is pretty much the same. Uh, you could, you know, use a tiny bit. It, it depends. It depends on the circuit. It depends on the conditions. But it's pretty much the same. Uh, uh, so many things on the chat. We are 520 concurrent viewers. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Remember to like and subscribe. <laughs> um, okay, if the aerodynamics are done correctly, the person generate more slipstream for the cars behind it. Yes, it did. Uh, so Paxmo says, if the aerodynamics are done correctly, the process should generate more slipstream for the cars behind and be difficult to follow in corners because of the smaller diffuser and high wing. Not exactly. It does generate more slipstream. Uh, but it is also a smaller car. It doesn't have that big of a frontal area like the Bentley, for example. And then you have to remind, um, to, to remember that it mostly generates downforce from the big rear right wing, which is also high. Okay, so the lower cars that follow behind, they get some dirty air, but it's not that big deal because the wing is so higher. Okay. Uh, while when you are following, for example, a uh, Aston Martin or a Ferrari, it's probably worse because they have all those big, big diffusers. And when you put your nose behind them, you get lots of, you know, down, uh, you get lots of aero understeer because of that. So, yes and no. Uh, Alex uh, Dustin asks, uh, my rear mirror is black. How do you turn it off? It saves a lot of uh, frame rate. Can you tell us? Yes. It does save a lot of frame rate. Um, I have used myself to not use it, so I switch it off. And I, I am very careful watching the radar. Radar plus uh, the, um, uh, the real-time gaps on the multifunctional display is almost as good as having, uh, if you learn how to do it, as having the... Um, the uh, the rear uh, mirrors. How to disable the mirror, rear, rear mirrors, sorry. <laughs> you go to the options, video, and uh, you go here into mirror quality and you just turn it off. Turn it off, that's it. Okay. Uh, thanks for the sausage flex. <laughs> true, true, very true, Duki. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, before doing another series of laps, guys, I want to show you something that we said about weight transfer. So, um, so let's go inside and uh, outside. <laughs> So let's go outside of the car. Now, let me see. I'm not sure if you guys can actually. I need to uh, start the mouse pointer. How was the name? I don't remember anymore, as usual. Uh, let me check mouse. No, uh, I don't remember. <laughs> anyway, so let's try this. Uh, follow car, disable. Okay, like that. Okay, so, um, as you know, guys, unfortunately, I cannot... Uh, maybe we should go back. So let me save this. For first thing. Okay, so first one. So let's say one. Pressures. Save. Okay. 
Let's go back for a moment, quit, and we go back again. Uh, Shanti, yes, I think so, they're still rendered. Okay, so this is the car, as we said. I think you can see now the uh, the mouse, hopefully. Not sure about that, but yes, I think you can see the mouse. So, now, as you all know, we have the center of gravity somewhere around here, okay? Now, all the forces that, you know, go into, into the car, from cornering, braking, accelerating, all those forces, uh, they apply, the forces are getting applied on the center of gravity, okay? So, the center of gravity is like the pivotal point of a lever, Okay, so you have the, the lever which the two extremes are your tires. You know, this is the one, and that's the other tire. And then you have uh, your center of gravity somewhere around here. Now, as you know, uh, when, you know, when you are braking with those cars, the tires and the duffers and everything, they can create something like 1.8 G. In under braking and under lateral, um, they they create something like uh, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6 peak. Uh, let's see if I can show you um, this differently. So let's go here. Oops, that's something I want to show you afterwards. So let's 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 open this. So okay, that's the Ferrari. Doesn't matter. So, let's say that you have your center of gravity, center of mass, as very rightfully someone said on the chat, uh, around here. Let's change color because this one is dreadful. Okay, let's do it like this. Okay, nice. Now, as we said, we have the distance between the two wheels, okay, here, like this. So let's do another strange color so that it is visible. So this is the situation more or less, okay. Now imagine that this is goes up here. It, it doesn't, but it's easier to understand. So when you are braking, of course, you get weight transfer. Okay, because of the forces that apply here, um, you get weight transfer. Now, as you know, it's much easier to rotate this thing. Let's see if we can rotate it. Okay. If the center is like that, it's easier to rotate this uh, with a small amount of force here, let's see if I can put something like this. Okay. Sorry about that. It's going to be terrible because I haven't, you know, prepared it beforehand. But hopefully I will be able to show you what I mean. So, you know that the longer the distance from the point of rotation, the less force you're going to, you're going to, have to create the same uh, uh, the, the the same movement. Okay. Now, the problem with the Porsche is that this distance is much shorter, because you know the wheels are not here, but they are here. They are the the difference. The wheelbase, okay, is not like this, like in the Ferrari for example, which has one of the longest wheelbases, but it is something like that. Which means that at the end you get, you know, the distance between those are shorter, you get much more effect from the same force, much more effect, because the lever is shorter. Okay? That's why when you are braking so hard with the, uh, uh, with the Porsche, the car tends to move around a lot. It wants to rotate. It wants to 
to change because the, all that weight is, be, is being transferred to the front and the rear end gets much more lighter, but still, you know, it has the weight at the, at the rear, it tends to, you know, the inertia tends to rotate it and the rear end wants to go at the front. So not only the, the Porsche has lots of weight at the rear, but it also has a very, very short wheelbase, the shorter of all by 20 centimeters, I think. It's the next car is longer by 20 centimeters or something like that. So uh, it is a car that moves a lot. It is a car that transfers the weights a lot at the front. And so that's why it needs stiff uh, suspension to control the, the weight transfer. Now, because of the same reason, you also have that much more traction when you're trying to accelerate because all that weight goes at the rear tires much faster and you get much traction out of that. And of course, you also get understeer on power because the front end becomes much lighter and you tend to go in understeer uh, again uh, when, uh, when you are accelerating out of the tires. So, as you can see, all those reasons create disadvantages, serious disadvantages, but also some serious advantages. Now, why the Porsche back in the times of vintage racing was so much better? Because back in vintage racing, we didn't have practically any significant downforce. Nowadays, those cars, you know, generate 600 kilos, 700 kilos, 500 kilos of downforce. Back in the days of vintage racing, there were like 100 kilos at most or nothing. Even before that, practically nothing. And so you had a car that pretty much all the cars had lots of power because they had lots of power, pretty much the same power that they have now. They had much worse tires, much worse uh, suspension design, and no downforce at all. Having the weight at the rear permitted to, uh, at the Porsches to have lots of traction out of the turns and so they were able to put that power down and accelerate sooner out of the turns. Obviously, they needed experienced drivers to, you know, uh, maintain the control of the car during the turning and braking. But once you could do this, then you could accelerate, it, you could accelerate much sooner. Um, that's why Porsche uh, managed to win so much um, back in the times. Now, in modern racing, again, some of the advantages remain, uh, but you, we also start having big disadvantages because other cars are able to create much more downforce, <clears throat> sorry, because they have much bigger diffusers, uh, they are more stable in GT racing because they are longer and that helps, you know, customer drivers and amateur drivers much more. Uh, they generate less drag and so on and so on. And they don't have so much, um, uh, they don't have so much traction issues anymore because of the high downforce and of the modern tires. I mean, the other cars, they don't have so much a big uh, problem with traction because of the modern tires that have much more grip and the modern aerodynamics. So that's why Porsche starts to have some issues with uh, the rear engine uh, 911 uh, design. Okay, back to the uh, driving again. Let me know at the chat if everything is proper and if you understood everything, if it's clear. Okay. Well, the 9, 917 was a completely different car. Let's not go into that. Well, first of all, there were mid-engine, but then they also had, they had no differentials. Everything was locked like a cart. Lots of things to, to tell about the 917. All right, so let's go back. Let's uh, load our setup with the correct pressures.
There are no three best cars in ACC, Punisher. Uh, Sunny Volpix, you haven't understood how it works, the aero variance of the setup. We have talked about that many times. If you go back to other videos, you can have a go at that. Maybe we will explain it again later. Here. <laughs> uh, Diesel, all Porsches had power on oversteer because they were set up like this, but still they could, you know, put down much better. Tell drivers of a uh, Ford Galaxy or a uh, Ford Mustang how they could, you know, put power down. <laughs> they would like, wait, 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 or, you know, put it down and just drift and wait until the rear tires, you know, cuts on. So you have to take everything into perspective every time. I mean, you see the old vintages go sideways because that's how you drive those cars back in the days and those tires, but still they had much traction to go sideways and move forward at the same time. While the old Ford Mustangs and Ford Galaxies, the uh, Lotus Cortina, or the Alfa Romeo GTR, they were drifting. They had to, you know, take care of the accelerator. Or you, you could still put it down, but you were losing time spinning and not moving forward as fast as the Porsches, right? <clears throat> Okay, let's drive. Uh, Claudio, uh, I won't because I just did it and it's going to be, you know, heavy. So let's drive it a bit and then we'll see again. Okay, so pressures are correct. Let's move on. Green light. Go, go, go. All right, so now we're going to see if with the correct pressures, the car behaves a little bit better. Okay. Thank you, Blind Stealer, Ron, and Thomas Graham for the follow. So let's start here. Hit up our tires. Do some laps. See if we can improve. We did what? We did uh, 37 low, 37.3. So let's see if we can do something like uh, 36 high or 37 flat with the correct pressures and then we're gonna do something I think interesting, fun, uh, very entertaining and very useful I also hope, hope so but first let's drive Whoa. now into this turn some people prefer to go way wide before the turn in some people like me prefer to stay at the middle of the road. Uh, it depends. I'm not so sure either myself if I'm doing it correctly. Uh, maybe some, you know, faster guys than me can tell us uh, what line is better to follow. All right, tires are warming, warming up. I'm still hitting the limiter. This turn is so exciting and tricky at the same time. Whoa! <laughs> oh my god. Uh, I got so excited that my nose is tickles me. All right. 
So tires are very good at the front, a little bit low at the rear, but let's keep going. What a turn. Uh, I've lost completely the apex. I'm not driving very well. Still, I'm learning the track and the car. Listen to that transmission whine. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, 37 flat. I think I could do even better. I was looking at my pressures and not at the road. And this is... Ah, this is what happens when you are doing stupid things. I'm looking too much of the of the chat. Let's try to do a decent lap. Let's see if we can do something lower than 37. I think we can do it. And then we're gonna do something fun. We're gonna play a, a game. Yeah, good exit. Better exit still. Nice. Full send it. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> So scary. Nice. Oh, that's a good lap. Nice, let's do a 36 mid. Ah. ah, not so good. I've lost some, some time here. Anyway, not bad, not bad at all. 
Oh, <laughs> no, I cannot, I cannot break that late. <laughs> I mean, it has great breaks. Iron Drag also helps, but not that late. Okay, let's go back to the pits. Uh, the front left is a little bit too high as a pressure, so we can work on that. But all in all, much better than before. And uh, honestly, the car handling is not, not, oh my god, <laughs> it's not helping me. I mean, I could not do a full race like this for sure. So I will try to improve the car. Uh, not that the, the, um, the setup is not fast, but for my driving style, which by the way, uh, I'm getting used to pushing front ends in cars, which are much easier to push, you know, much more predictable, slower to change direction. With this car, I'm having more problems. You can see that I'm, you know, moving the steering wheel a lot, left and right, to try to maintain the uh, line of the car and the stability of the car. So I will, you know, do some changes and see if I can improve on that and make a better uh, race setup for my driving style or most importantly, my level of uh, driving this car as we are right now. All right, cool, nice, very nice. Let's go to the garage, set up. Tiny little bit of uh, change at the, uh, um, at the pressure, so one, two, three down, because we saw this going up to 28 at some turns, but, you know, we will get it when we go through the start-finish line, so three clicks down, this is pretty, <clears throat> oh, today I'm, I cannot talk, this is pretty good, this I could use one more click up, and the same here, so one, two, three, something like that, okay, let's save this, so let's call this uh, 1B because we're still at the pressures. And now we're going to do something very interesting, I think. Okay, first of all, chat. Let's see what you guys are telling. All right, so. Uh, uh, Bruno Oliveira says, what the right countermeasures to make when the tires in the tire up starts to become yellow? There are no real countermeasures you can do. You can make the car softer. You can make the dampers softer, if possible, okay? But sometimes, with some cars, in some conditions, the tires will tiny bit overheat. Becoming yellow is not a big deal. It's not like you're losing tons of grip. Not really, okay? You're not losing grip, to be honest. You're losing grip if they become, you know, uh, orange. But greenish, uh, lime, yellow, something like that, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, really. Concentrate on the pressures. The Pirelli tires are made specifically to have a very wide range of temperature that they are still working from, I mean, even down to 60, 65 degrees, they're still working pretty well. And even up to 105, 110 degrees, they're still working pretty well. The ideal is from 70, 75 to 95. 75 to 95 is the ideal. You start looking at that little bit of little bit of you know yellowish color, greenish yellowish color when you are at 100 degrees. Don't bother. You still have 99.99 percent of the grip. Seriously, I'm talking you. I know the data, so don't worry about that. Worry about the pressures. Okay. The only thing that obviously it will accelerate a little bit more is the tire wear. When you see that green is, your tire wear is a tiny bit higher than normal, than normal greens. But again, we're talking about, you know, 0.01%, something like that. Uh, thank you, Sim Racing SK. Uh, yeah, brake ducts, we can, we can use that too. Yes, exactly. Diesel is very correct on that. You can use brake ducts to, you know, get the temperature of the tires down because the temperature of the brakes uh, influences a lot the temperature of the tires so Dazzle is very correct on that 
Uh, Danny, Danny, we can talk about that, but not now. TC1, TC2, we will talk about that later on today. Okay. Okay. Well, yes, Max Daniel, uh, the Max Daniel says, all my races at Zandvoort end with blistering on the left eyes. On some circuit, Zandvoort, Barcelona, you get so much weight and friction on one side of the car that, you know, just, I mean, for example, the last turn is incredibly hard on the tires. Uh, so it is as it is, you know, there is no perfection in, uh, uh, sim in, in racing, real racing, and luckily now also in sim racing. So, some years ago, we were all driving with the numbers. Ah, you wanted to have your tire pressures, your tire temperatures at 85, and that was it. It would, you know, you could break it at 85 and it would stay like that for all the lap. That is not the case anymore, luckily, because that's also what is happening in real life. So, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, Vincent Erbrich, that also works in ACC. Guys, I won't talk about Alex Zanardi. My thoughts are with Alex. You know, he had another accident. Uh, I won't talk until I have some, you know, proper news. I will respectfully wait and see what happens. Let's hope for the better. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, no name left says something very interesting. Says. To me, the Porsche performed better with a bit higher pressures than other cars, like around 27.8, 28.1, compared to other cars with 27.5. Uh, like the higher pressure support a bit better. You are absolutely correct. Uh, the higher weight transfers, as we said, uh, need more support from the profile of the tire. So higher pressure gives more support from, uh, for the tire. So the footprint works better. So if you think that it's better, then go for it. As we said, there is not a definite number. There is a range of number from 27 lowest, you know, 27.4 up to 21. Uh, all that works. What works better depends on the car and on the circuit and on the driving side. So don't worry about that. If you think it works better, go for it. You are correct. Uh... All right, okay, so we had a go at the tire pressures. We know they are correct. Now it's time to do something particular. So what I have prepared for you guys is, uh, sorry about that, where are we? Is this nice little graphic. Where is it? Here it is, okay. So, the map of the circuit. Now, it's better if you do this with, you know, an um, Excel sheet or something similar. Uh, but to better understand everybody, I've made it on top of the map of the circuit. So, as you can see, we have the number of the turns. One, two, three, four, five, and so on. And at each number of the turn, I have put this turn in, cost, exit. Uh, I've only put those uh, into the uh, turns that, you know, they are important for us. I mean, for example, I haven't put this on number two. I have put this on number three. You see here, turn three, because number two is not a turn, pro practically. Uh, so I've only put this on uh, the turns that they are important for the handling of the car. So what we're going to do, we're going to separate each turn in three phases. This is basic. Usually I separate the turn in at least four phases. 
but this is basic. We need to understand how it works. And three phases of each turn are more than enough. So turn in, which means what happens to the handling of the car, how the car behaves when you are turning and releasing the brakes. Okay, so turning in while releasing the brakes. That's the first phase. We have to understand what is going on in that situation. Questing, which means that you have released the brakes and you are going from the turn in to the apex of the turn. Let me show you a little bit better what I mean by that. So turn in usually is from here. Okay. From here to, whoops, to here, something like this, okay? Right, so let's do this red because we are breaking. And uh, this is also red, okay? Something like that. This is a little bit goes through the yellow like this. Oops. Okay. Now, then we have uh, the costing phase where you are not touching either the brake or the accelerator. You are just releasing the pedals, no pedal input, and you are traveling with the car towards the apex, which happens more or less, depending on the turn. It could be later, it could be sooner. It doesn't matter. This is just an example. So it happens somewhere here. Okay? And at some point, you start accelerating. Right? So you accelerate. Back to the accelerator again and you are exiting the turn full on power. Okay. So those are the four phases, the, the three basic three basic phases of, uh, of a turn. We are going to analyze what the car is doing into each phase. Okay. But before doing that, before doing that, it is also important to understand is, is it my driving style or is it the car's reaction okay so that is important to understand so how we're we gonna do this because someone in the comments uh, of of the YouTube um, community comments he asked me okay how can I understand if I am experiencing understeer or oversteer because my driving is bad or because the car is experiencing where, where is the difference and that is a great question that is a great question we which often people do not ask themselves this kind of question. Many times, you know, people do not ask themselves this kind of question. They experience something and they believe it's always the car usually, you know. Uh, so they try with the setup to um, control this and they end up ruining all the handling uh, by many different ways. So how we are going to do this without using the MOTEC, because MOTEC, you know, many people say you can use the MOTEC and it is true, but to use the MOTEC, you need to learn and know how to read telemetry. And it's not an easy thing. It's not at all an easy thing. Telemetry means that you have to train your brain to recognize patterns. Okay. And if you don't know what is happening on, on the car when you're driving, it's even harder to recognize patterns in the telemetry. Telemetry is not a magic wand where you are going to look at it and it will tell you, oh, here you have oversteer, here you have understeer, do this to change it. Doesn't work like that. That's why usually, you know, the, fir you, the, the first thing you do in sim racing is that you are the driver. And there is a lot that the driver can understand before going into the telemetry. Telemetry is a higher level that you have to transform yourself from a driver into an engineer, into a telemetrist, okay? But that's a higher level. Let's start from the basics. Let's start from what the driver can do to understand what the car does. And one of the most important things that uh, 
circuit training offers to, to people that want to learn, I mean in real life, okay, in real life, is an exercise like the following. So here's what we're going to do. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to travel through the turns on the correct uh, gear, but a little bit slower, not that fast. Okay, not that fast. So go for a lap around the circuit, following the correct line, but slower, okay? A little bit slower. What we want to do is being able to maintain the line, okay, that we want to follow when we are pushing, uh, without big problems, without, you know, corrections. We just want to follow the line, okay? So now I'm doing a lap like this to show you, and then we're going to analyze what is happening inside the turn. Okay, in a minute. So let first show you the kind of speed we are using. Again, here, like that, you see. Not very slow, okay, but still easy to maintain the line that we want, okay. Again, second gear, turn, the wheel like this, wait and see what's happening, okay? So this is what we're going to do. Why we're going to do that? All right, so let's see. Now, first of all, we're gonna try this, at, for starters, uh, into the very long uh, bends. So the first one, the third one, uh, the last one, bends like that, not at the CK, not at those not short bends nice. So in a bend like this, we arrive in fourth gear, okay? We go in, release. Now, when I release instantly, does the car goes inside? And when I go to the accelerator hard, does the car wants to oversteer or does it want to go straight? So let's try here in second gear. So we're gonna go inside like this, okay? Like this and release. We went straight. Let's try it again on the other turn. So release, it wants to rotate. First gear, release. A little bit of under, but it was, you see, it goes inside. If I turn more, it goes inside. I don't have big problems to uh, turn the car into the turn while coasting. Let's try this in fourth gear here. Okay, so fourth gear. Go in, go in. So it wants to go in. You see that the lower the speed it wants to go in. Okay, so that's good. So in coasting, the car seems relatively stable. You see, it doesn't really, it, it wants to over rotate, but just by a tiny bit, not too much. You see, here again, it rotates, it doesn't, turns around a lot. That means that in coasting without input pedal, okay, the car is pretty much stable. Okay, so let's try it again. Even if for in first gear, you see in first gear, it doesn't go to really over rotate. Again, third gear, it doesn't go to over rotate too much. It does over rotate a tiny bit, okay? But not too much. Again, release. Ah, here a little bit more. So at medium speeds, it wants to rotate a little bit more. You saw what happened. We released immediately the accelerator and the car instantly went inside. Let's try it again. Second gear, so slow. Yeah. Not that bad, but still, I don't feel, you know, a big instability of the rear end when I'm not touching any pedal. So that means that the car in coasting, in coasting, in pure coasting, is, you know, simply natural, neutral. It's neutral. It doesn't want to understeer, it doesn't want to oversteer. Again, it is important, you know, to go in like this and not do that, okay? So, because obviously, if you are exaggerating the steering input like this, it will either understeer, okay, 
or oversteer, but that's my problem in that case. The car needs soft inputs, precise inputs, like that, like this. That's it, okay. If I go too fast and I go wide, like just happened, that's my problem. It's not the car's problem. And it's easy to understand that because, you know, you just go into the turn, you have to go to the speed that usually you should go, not faster, not slower, okay? You see, the car completely follows the line. So that's one important lesson. So what that does it mean? Let's pause for a minute and let's go back here okay so very interesting cost neutral the cost is neutral the car doesn't want to over rotate here again cost neutral okay this one doesn't even we didn't even try it but it's no big deal even this one in uh, when we are going downhill even here it was almost neutral we can we can write here neutral maybe slight rotation okay we can do this cost again here neutral assume no problem neutral whoops okay again here completely neutral over here too and here maybe here we had a slight understeer a couple of times so let's write it slide understeer okay so that's it okay right excellent here everything was neutral no problem about that uh, also here too and here too no problem here we have again that was a high speed corner we had neutral with a slight rotation so let's write this down slight rotation okay uh this one is for this corner here number four because i didn't have any space so again that was neutral no problem about it now why we are writing all that we need that to make a mental map of what we experience around the circuit I mean, oh, oh, many times I'm asking, you know, my co-drivers that we are preparing a setup to do an endurance race, okay? Uh, I'm asking them, how is the car at turn one? How do you feel the car around the turns? And they Either they don't know what to tell me in a specific turn, or they will go into engineering, oh, it's understeery. And then I'm going like, where? Turn in, costing, exit which turn and like oh um, pretty much everywhere that doesn't help that doesn't help at all the driver needs to give correct feedback it's like i give you an example it's like going to the mechanic and tell them something like oh, i hear a strange sound with the car the mechanic says where what kind of a sound in what occasion and you say oh, well, i don't know i hear a strange sound and then the mechanic, you know, puts the, 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 uh, the car, uh, switches on the car, and, I don't know, the engine goes in three cylinders, it goes like, prop, 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 prop. I mean, <laughs> that's easy to understand. But there are other things that, you know, he cannot understand it because you do not give the correct feedback, all right? So you need to, to give the correct feedback, not to the engineer, but to yourself, too. You need to compartment why, why am i choosing such terrible words you need to divide <laughs> the circuit into turns and each turn into phases okay you need to divide every single one and write it down because it is impossible to remember everything by memory okay so write down each phase of the turn for each turn of the circuit so right now we already know that the car is not bad at all in costing. We don't have any serious problems. Next thing, one of the most difficult things, is braking. So let's go in and try the same thing while slightly applying brake force on the pedals. Okay? All good?
Oh, cool. Okay. So, let's move on. So, what we're we gonna try here? We're gonna start instantly here. Fourth gear and slight break. Whoa! Did you saw that? Did you saw slight braking? I wasn't 100% braking. Let's see the replay right away. Uh, toggle hood inside. Let's move forward. Okay, we are here. Let's go slow. Please watch the brake pedal here, okay? So let's go in. This goes down. Watch the brake pedal on the HUD, all right? So we go in at the normal speed that we would go, even slower. And at some point now, I will apply a little bit of braking. Look at, look at that. It's like not even 20%, it's like 10%. Look at how the car rotates. That's a lot of rotation with, you know, and now I'm braking and panicking because I'm like, oh my God, what is happening? I mean, look at it from the outside. Okay. And this always happens <coughs> when you are applying small amounts of braking force. Because at high amounts of braking force, the ABS saves you. You know, it distributes the braking. Look at that. Look at how much angle. I mean, I'm, I'm delivering tofu here. Takumi. <laughs> I mean, it's the rifter time, right? So um, why is that? Because as we said, this car moves the weight a lot to the front. Okay. And it all that inertia from the big rear engine wants to rotate and move forward. So at high speeds, just the tiny amounts of braking creates way too much oversteer. And that's one big example. Let's move on into the other turns and see what happens. Braking. Second gear. Not that bad. Not that bad. Oh, a little bit of over rotation. First gear, it's good. First gear, not that bad. Let's try it again in fourth gear. Oh, there it is again. <laughs> Dear God. So again, high speed. Oversteer. Again. Oh, ooh, slap into my face. That was nasty. That was... Alright, so. Let's try it here at the second gear turns. I had some understeer into this turn. Probably it's the camber of the road that doesn't help. Right. So first gear, no big deal. So the mechanical grip is good. At low speeds, we don't have any big issues. But at mid to high speeds, we have big issues with uh, turning oversteer. Ooh, look at that. Let's try it again at slow speeds. Oh, way too much. But again, you see, understeer here. No big deal. This is mid speed. And again, oversteer. Thanks, Ivan, Mikhail, and Michael Berend for the follow. Oh my god. You see here. And again, third gear. Oversteer again. Oh, saved it. Oof. Thanks, Dan. A little bit of oversteer here. And 
and again a little bit of oversteer. Also in second gear, on some turns, when the speed is medium, we have some oversteer at uh, slight braking. No problem here, no big issues, or at least even if there is some oversteer, I can control it easily and actually it helps me rotate the car so I don't mind. But here again, as soon as the speed starts to climb, we have problems. So, what are we going to do? We have some results. Let's go back and write it down. Okay, so turn in here. Neutral. Turning in third gear here. Slight oversteer. Okay. Slight oversteer here. Turning in number four. Neutral. This, okay. We don't, we don't care about this. So zero. Here, sev severe. Severe oversteer. Whoops. Come on, what am I doing? All right, this is really bad here. This is oversteer. This is rotation. Let's keep call this rotation. Okay, so it doesn't really bother us too much. Um, here it's some rotation some under it depends it depends on the line so we're gonna check this turn better here it is pretty neutral no big deal so i i believe in the number 11 it's more my line than the car here we have again rotation 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 okay i will also make this one instead of slight oversteer oops I will call it rotation. And here we have again severe over oversteer. All right, like that. This one is neutral. Okay. So you can see now that we have a pattern. Okay. So actually two patterns in slow turns, the turn in and the light braking is either neutral or even it helps us you know to rotate the car without problems of controlling the car in high speed turns we have severe oversteer severe oversteer and we have pretty clear oversteer also in mid speed turns okay so this is a very good indication that something simply doesn't work properly that i mean this is something that will at least depending on my driving style my driving style it it um influences my driving and it doesn't permit me to attack the corners and go for a better lap because i am really scared going into those turns and being scared means that you have to do many small you know corrections to go into the turn you are waiting for the car to calm down and then you accelerate or you turn, you know, to stabilize the car, you have to wait. So that severe oversteer for my driving style is not something that I want. Now, there are other drivers that might be filling perfectly the car into the, the same car into those corners because they might be more precise with the steering wheel. They might be more uh, smooth with the, with the pedal inputs. Doesn't matter. You write it down. If you are if you have rota if you feel just a rotation into this turn okay then write here rotation and that will then give you different setup uh, choices when you are going to change the setup right so by doing that you cannot uh, you cannot uh, say that oh i don't know if it's my driving or if it's the car no it's the car for your driving Okay, because you are not really pushing the car. We are doing specific um, situations and specific inputs to understand what the car does. Okay, okay. So next step, 
let's see what happens at the exit. Right? Let's see what happens at the exit. Everything clear right now? Don't care about what we're going to do at the setup right now. Let's just uh, understand what we are doing. Okay? What the car does. Here we understand, we try to understand what the car does for very specific and as much as possible isolated driver inputs. Driver inputs. We are not pushing the car. We are just doing small, specific and isolated driver inputs and the car reacts. How the car reacts? We write it down. Once we have a clear vision of everything and we can understand and find patterns, then we're going to change the setup. Okay? Again, as we said, this will help you to understand how the car reacts and then, you know, change it for your liking. Okay, your uh, driver inputs and your notes, the notes that you're going to take, might be completely opposite from mine. Doesn't matter. It means that you're driving differently. Okay? Okay. And now, exits. Okay, so we keep on driving, we are going to arrive to the apex of the corner and we are going to hammer the accelerator now and see what happens. So second gear inside here, whoops, like that and hammer. A little bit of power oversteer, try again, go in, hammer, again, oversteer, ooh. I also touch the grass, obvious, no worries, we are doing this purposely to understand what, what we're going to do and possibly do a proper donut, I'm not even capable of doing this. Ciao Simone! Alright, so first gear again, hammer the Oh, now we, we hammered the accelerator and we had some understeer. This is flat out, no problems. This is again flat out with this car, no problems. Let's try this. Whoops. Now, hammer. Very neutral here. Hammer. Ah, a little bit of understeer. Ooh. Got some light damage. Light damage. Okay, let's try to close this lap. I don't know what happens here. Also, the tires are you know, very dirty right now, but hammer it. Oversteer. Control oversteer. Alispera. First gear. Whoops. Some oversteer here. That's understeer here. And this was neutral, but probably we were too slow. Let's uh, change the car because we have some damage, and that's not good because we might have also aerial damage. So return. Uh, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Mattis. And thanks, Brenos, for the follow. Thank you so much, guys. Okay, so again, as usual, back. <laughs> All right, so second gear. That was pretty neutral here. Third gear. Some oversteer, but there is also a crest here, so you have to remember this. A little bit of oversteer. It's more rotation than oversteer there. We're really provoking it and trying to understand what's happening, but... No. That's okay here. Understeer. It's 
little bit of, of uh, rotation, rotation. It was pretty good. Over rotation here, but we know that this turn is really difficult and strange. Some rotation again. Understeer. Here is slight, slight understeer. If we go flat out, it would be nice to do it flat out, but not so possible. See some rotation. But again, we are hammering the accelerator. Alright, I think we have an idea again on what is happening in the accelerator. Uh, one of the things we could do now is that we could try a lap that is a little bit faster and that will give us a better indication of what happens you see again understeering into that turn of what of what happens when we're trying to push the car but until then let's go back okay so what do we have here here we have some rotation what happened no <laughs> it did refresh of the page instead of writing so rotation, here we have some over rotation, okay, rotation again here, that is flat out, we don't care about that, okay, here we had some understeer, and again here severe understeer, now here we had some rotation, Oops, where we are? Ah, yeah, here. So you have understeer and then oversteer. That's a very tricky turn. Here it goes okay, nothing serious. I will put rotation, but honestly, no big deal. And here we have understeer. And also here, understeer. All right, so. Hello, Jason from uh, down under <laughs> <clears throat> what happened all right so um, let's see if we can find a pattern and it is important to you know as I said know how to read and find the patterns driving fast and making setups is all about finding patterns and what we see here is, <clears throat> sorry, the cars in slow speed turns, the car in the slow speed uh, turns is pretty much good. Uh, yes, you can improve everything, but I mean, it's a good car. It doesn't do anything that I cannot control. Okay. I could use maybe a little bit of extra rotation somewhere, but honestly, I can handle this. Now, in the mid speed and fast speed corners, it has both rotation or severe oversteer, okay, uh, in, um, in turn in, okay, you can see here, severe oversteer in turn in, oversteer here, and pretty much always understeer in exit. That happens in all mid to high speed turns. Again, here you see severe oversteer, understeer in exit. That happens to pretty much all the mid to high speed turns. This is a pattern. It doesn't happen in the slow turns. It happens identical or pretty much identical in all to mid to high speed corners. Here is a pattern for you. What this means? 
that means that we have an aerial problem. And it's not just that we miss downforce, it's that the car is probably too much pitch sensitive. You know that those cars, by now you should be uh, understand, you should have understand that. Uh, hello, Dookie, thank you so much. See you next time, mate. Uh, so you should have understood by now that those cars are extremely sensitive to ride height and they are very sensitive to uh, pitch. So pitch, what it means? It means that the front end goes down and the rear end goes up and vice versa. So every time the car does this movement, the aerial balance moves forward when it goes to braking like that or backwards when you are accelerating. And they, it moves front and back a lot, a lot. And so, uh, if this car has big oversteer when you're braking and big understeer when you're accelerating at high end speeds, it means that it is very pitch sensitive. So, how can we cure pitch sensitiveness? Well, we have a couple of uh, possibilities. Okay. Now, usually, as I said, if we go back to the garage, uh, usually. Uh, we could, hello Tebs and uh, Yuha, welcome. We could change the ride heights and create more or less oversteer. That's the easy way. Okay, we know that step number two is you go into the setup and you lower or raise the ride height of the rear, or if you want a bigger effect of the front. And by that way, you move the aero balance to the front or to the rear. And you modify the handling of the car more understeer or more oversteer. Okay, we could do that easily here. Uh, it's well, the Porsche is a little bit of a trickier car because it doesn't have so much downforce. It's not always the case that if you, you know, lower or raise the rear right height, you're gonna create much of a difference. Okay, and you can see that here. When I'm lowering, it doesn't really move a lot, or sometimes even goes back and forth uh, the front aero variation. Why? Because as we said, this car doesn't really generate a lot of downforce from the diffuser. So the pitch sensitivity is not so much from the diffuser, but from the front right head probably. But we know that that works. Okay. So let's just move this thing to 65 like this. And have a go. Just a simple go. We are. This is not what we're going to do. But I have already many times told you that step one, pressures. Step two, ride height. So let's try the ride height and see if we improve. Uh, Troll Turismo, I think this is the new subscriber sound that you are listening to. Well, okay, let's do a lap. I will still have some, but it's better. I think it's better already. Understeer here. Oh, <laughs> that's my fault. More understeer here. A little bit better in turning and more understeer. Ooh. Let's try to heat up a little bit the tires, but. Slow speeds, not a big deal. We can control this. Thanks, Matt. Okay, third gear here. Understeer again. And here we should go flat out, but oh, so much understeer. Look at that. So it works. But does it also work in the turn in? I don't know, we're gonna find out. 
tires are still cold, but let's try. Slow speeds, a little bit of understeer, more than I would like, but it works, it works. As we said, right hand, it works. So lower rear right hand, it made the car more stable, more understeery, of course, but more stable. Let's see if it's still, you know, more, uh, so much speed sensitive. So now that we're gonna break down into fourth gear, oh, understeer here. Ah, better. But again, look at that understeer. Way too much. Ooh. Very understeer. Also understeer into that slow, me to slow turn in. A bit of rotation here, I've managed it, but ugly. <laughs> you guys are playing a, a, a drink game. What are you, what are you, what is the drink game? Let me know. <laughs> you bastards. <laughs> Understeer again. That's not gonna end well for my tires in the long run. <laughs> Let me know what is the what's the game. Okay, so I'm waiting. I'm waiting for uh, to to know what is the the drink game tonight. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> for, it's for. GT4! <laughs> I'm gonna wait and see if you guys are gonna drink again because I said GT4! <laughs> or is it only when someone writes it on the chat? I don't know. <laughs> yes, it's GT4! <laughs> oh my god, guys, you're gonna end up really, really badly. <laughs> or TC. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so we found out that indeed altering the right head changes the handling of the car. Okay. Um, but in reality, it doesn't really change the pitch sensitivity. The pitch sensitivity remains simply. The whole aero balance is more rearwards, which means that you get more understeer, especially at the acceleration of mid to high speed turns. Okay, so you get more understeer everywhere, and that understeer, when you are turning in, it becomes more like um, you know less understeer. So it doesn't become oversteer like before, but it becomes less understeer. But the pitch sensitivity does remain. Could we do something else to make the pitch sensitivity less evident? Yes, we can. <laughs> so let's go back to 70 millimeters rear right height at before. Now, I don't know if you remember, guys, but the pitch sensitivity is created by the downforce, the you know, the, the vicinity of the front splitter to the ground, so the front right height, and the rear diffuser right height. So as those two change right heights, the whole um, aero balance moves forward or backwards. Right, this is clear. Now, we do have one aerodynamic element that doesn't care about the pitch at all. And that's the rear wing. The rear wing doesn't care at all about the pitch. Because whatever the pitch you have, the rear wing always get fresh, clean air from the high... Uh, from, uh, after, after the roof, I mean, from, from the, the high uh, level of, of the airflow. So it really doesn't care if it's higher or lower from the pitch of the car. The pitch of the car is just, you know, half degree. So it doesn't really care. Which means that you have an element that creates downforce, okay? And 
it's always constant, the downforce. So if the rear wing creates something like 40% of the whole downforce of the car, that's it, that's always that. The front splitter and the rear splitter, let's say that they create 30 and 30, this changes as the car pitches forwards or backwards, okay? So the front creates 40 and the rear 20, or the front creates 20 and the rear 40, but the rear wing still creates 40 constantly. So what happens if we raise the rear right wing, okay? So if we raise the rear... Thank you so much, Neuroticker, for the tenor. Thank you, mate. Appreciate. Thank you so much. Appreciate the support. So if you generate more downforce from the rear wing, okay, that downforce remains stable. And then the car, so the rear wing ends up, you know, generating more percentage of the whole downforce of the car, which means that it also immediately makes the pitch sensitivity less severe. It's not like it disappears, but it is less severe because before you had 40% from the rear wing and 60% from the other two elements, and those other two elements were very high pitch sensitive. If we raise the rear wing, we get 60% or 50% from, from the rear wing and 50% from the other two. So the other two now influence a little bit less the, da the, the downforce balance of the whole car. So high rear wing not only generates more downforce, but also makes automatically the car less pitch sensitive. That is very important to understand and to remember. Of course, it generates more drag, but we don't care about that. Why? Because that's the track. Find me a straight line. I mean, we have only one straight line and it is very short. The, all, the, the, other, the whole other circuit is turn after turn after turn. I mean, even that thing that could have been a turn, it still uh, could have been a, a straight line. It's still a chicane, a long, fast chicane, but it's still a chicane. So uh, this is a circuit where we really could use and try a very high downforce, high drag setup, at least, you know, for uh, people like me, like you probably, that, you know, we're not going to follow. I mean, I'm pretty sure the aliens just go down to rear wing, something like five, and still deal with it. Fine. But let's make a setup for us. Let's make a safe setup that permits us to push and make, you know, uh, a lap time of like 36 without big issues. And that's with the fuel load of 60 liters, which means that during the race, we can attack because the most important thing is to be to feel safe on the car and be able to attack. So let's raise the rear wing by two clicks and go up to 10 degrees, see what we get. Of course, people will say, but Aris, if you raise the rear wing, you're also going to have even more understeer. Yes, but we can deal with that with the mechanical balance. The most important fact is that we eliminate some of the pitch sensitivity like that. Okay, and pitch sensitivity is an ugly beast that can bite you while you don't want it. Uh, so let's create a higher downforce car and see how the car it creates. It's going to be an understeer. Let's find out. All right. In we go. Ah, oh, car seems stable. Nice, look at that. Ooh, stability. Not too much understeer, to be honest. Oh, that's nice. Oh, come on. <laughs> Missed completely the braking mark.
Ah, uh, that here we had some understeer, but probably is the line here. Oh, that was so nice here. I'm pretty sure we're gonna have understeer here. Yep. We need to modulate, so of course, on that very fast hand, right turn, we have issues. Very good braking, of course, the extra drag and downforce helps us. Very neutral. Oops, sorry about that. I mean, second lap and the delta is pretty good. Oh, I'm pushing it. Oh, that's so much more stable. Oh, I like that. I love stability. Nice. Look at that. Delta is green. And I, I feel some understeer, so we can improve on that. Look at that. I'm going to do a faster lap already. Nice. Yeah, I have to wait here. But uh, it seems that... I haven't lost that much time. Fastest lap already. Oh, so much stability in the turning. Love it. Tires are much better. Now you will probably see from my driving style that I can push the car, I can attack the corners. I can brake later, I can attack and not afraid, you know, to, to turn into. Look at that. Yeah. Ah, could have done better. Look at that. Look at that lap time. Ah, my bad here. Nice, 36.4, it could have easily be a 36.3 or 2. Oops. Okay, now pressures are a little bit on the low side, so we can improve from there. So let's go back to the pits and uh, see what we can do. I mean, just look at this. I mean, I can, I can attack this corner so much better, so much better. Even this one. Now, if I can eliminate some of the understeer that I got, that would be really great. We'll see how we can do this. I'm not sure yet, but uh, we'll find a way.
<laughs> Guys, after after this, I'm gonna ask you all for repetition because you are all drunk and I'm talking alone <laughs> and you are doing nothing <laughs> about it. <laughs> all right, so um, this was really great. This was really great because I was able to attack the corners much much better uh, again this is for me that's my problem all right because i need stability to be able to attack the because i'm not so precise and again we're talking about me i'm not so precise and smooth into my steering wheel inputs and into my pedal inputs i'm a little bit more you know aggressive uh the the lines are definitely definitely precise when i'm trained but how I tra transition from you know straight line into the turn, I'm a little bit aggressive for that. That's my error, and by practice I'm trying to improve it. But I know this is my problem. Um, so what I'm going to do, what what I'm doing here is trying to make all the cars in a way that they help me when I'm doing this bad thing, because that's that's a problem of the driver always. So I'm trying to help myself. When I'm doing this thing, the car has also to accommodate me and help me by not over-rotating. Without over-rotation, once uh, the car is set, I can go into the accelerator and correct the line and exit the corner fast enough. Okay, so what we did right now was exactly what I needed to be faster in the turning. Let's see if we can improve on the exit. Okay, so we need exit. So what we're going to do, one of the things we could do is uh, raise a little bit the camber at the front. That could be an idea. It might uh, consume more the front tires, but it might be a good thing. And we will talk about that in a minute. Uh, so let's see in the mechanical grip if we have something we could do. Um, the wheel rate at the back is a little bit at the mid to low side. Well. Um, <laughs> right. So here's what we could do. As we said, this car is quite a bit, you know, pitch sensitive. We corrected this with um, the uh, the rear wing. Now the rear wing is higher, and now the car is much less pitch sensitive. We could also use stiffer wheel rates. Stiffer wheel rates means that the car will move less in pitch, also in roll, but less in pitch. Less movement in pitch means even more stable platform under uh, pitch. Okay, because less pitch, the aero platform is more stable. How to do this, as we said? Stiffer wheel rates. Now, stiffer wheel rates, especially at the rear, doesn't only mean that we have less pitch sensitivity, but it also gives us more rotation from the mechanical balance. We know that stiffer axis loses grip faster, not has less grip. That's that's the important thing here, always. Remember this. A stiffer axis, so stiffer wheel spring, wheel rate, whatever, okay, doesn't mean that you have less grip, necessarily. It might also happen this if you go from one extreme to another. But it loses the grip sooner than before. Why? Because the stiffer it is, the faster the wheel uh, sorry, the faster the weight transfer will happen. Okay, when the springs are are soft, okay, and you go into the turn, the body will start to roll. Okay, with soft springs, it takes time to roll. By the time it needs to end the roll movement, absorbs the weight transfer. So the weight transfer moves slower. We are talking tenths of a second, even less than tenths of a second. But there is a difference. So, if you have a stiffer rear part of the car, stiffer than the front, it means that the weight transfer at the rear is going to be faster because there is less roll. And so, less roll, finished, full weight transfer. The front will be a little bit softer, which means it will move like that, it will roll more, and during that time, the weight shift 
will be longer. What that does, what this means? It means that the rear will arrive at the limit of the grip by loading the tires sooner, okay? And the front will follow. If I load the tire sooner, I will get more grip sooner, but then I can also go over that limit of grip sooner. So the the axis that will lose grip sooner if I'm you know pushing the car over the limit, it's gonna be the rear one because it's stiffer. Faster will will uh, uh, weight shift, faster overwhelming of the grip, and it will lose grip sooner. That means it will help me rotate. So at the initial turning, the faster weight shift will stabilize the rear because I will get the grip sooner. But as the turning keeps going on and I'm going also into the accelerator, the stiffer rear end will start to lose grip and will help me rotate the car. Will it be enough? I don't know. We're going to see. So one click stiffer wheel rate at the rear. We could also use probably a stiffer anti-roll bar, one click, maybe it's too much, we'll see. And uh, maybe 4.2 camber at the front. So all of that will probably you know, help us rotate the car a little bit more by mechanical balance, not by aerodynamic balance. So let's go out and see. Um, Alexander Kramaski asks, uh, in other games, sports has more rear camber than front. Why NCC is counterwise? Is it real camber uh, in real Porsche? Well, here's the thing. Um, it is true that with more rear camber, you can get more grip. And the Porsche likes that, especially the first generation, the one before that. The problem is that if you use lots of rear camber, you're going to wear out the rear tires sooner. So for longer races and not, you know, for sprint races like the Porsche Cup, the Porsche Cup uses extreme cambers, okay, because there are sprint races. For more, for longer races, you want to preserve the tire wear of your rear tires. So you use less camber to preserve a little bit the tire wear, okay? And obviously having this, you have to do other things around it. So it's, it's not uh, wrong neither to the other simulators and neither here. You can use more camber and it works perfectly fine, especially on the older generator, on the older version uh, of the Porsche and especially on the Porsche Cup car. But it will last for half an hour races, which are sprint races of the Porsche Cup. All right, so let's try this. Uh, pack smooth, that is also a very good thing. You can use a uh, stiffer bump and generally stiffen dumpers to also help with the same thing that we said and reduce rolling. Okay, let's try and see if we have improved or if we overdid it. Seems stable, but obviously still cold tires. Oh, I think I didn't even change the pressure. So let's try this and then try the pressures. Oh, that's a very nice turn in here. And some rotation. You see some very nice and gentle rotation at the exit. But still cold tires, so let's wait. Good. Eh. Here the aero balance, you know, gives us some problems.
Nice, very good. Ah. Ah. Too much. Too much of everything there. We managed to maintain the gap on the delta. Well, almost. It's going down. Nice. You see how it controlled the pitch sensitivity here. But still, ah. Uh, still a bit too much understeer. I'm asking way too much from the car. Probably I lost also some pressure from the tires going over there. Alright, let's see if we can do a better lap, but the car seems better. Still some high speed, uh, own power oversteer. Which I don't know if we can fix, but we can try. Very deep braking and still we made the apex and everything nice. Oh, we're going do, we're going really do good. Ah, uh, my bad. My bad. Somehow I saved it, but that was all my bad. Uh, a little bit of understeer here. Uh, again, my bad. And I've lost everything. Oh my god. This is terrible driving. Don't do like Aris. It, do it does turn a little bit better still have some problems but as you can see it permits me to attack really hard up to the point that you know the car can't make it because I'm I'm a donkey and I'm attacking really really hard even here is much better than before I mean look at that Even, even faster lap with all the errors. Ah. Okay, that was me. <laughs> I'm pushing too much. Oh my god, yes, but... Yeah, we can we can improve. We're making so many errors here that. Thanks, Mib Duke, for the follow. All right. We still have some understeer, so let's see if we can improve on that. Okay. You just need just a tiny bit on the exit. And it will be great, especially at high speeds, which reminds me 
that this car has a great future that other cars don't have. It has a front splitter. And it's something that, you know, makes small adjustments. We can use it. So, one, two clicks. Let's see what will happen. Might be, you know, for, for the better. Might not. We'll see. Okay? Right. So, uh, the dampers, we could use some extra bumping here. So, let's go two clicks up here. Uh, let's leave the rebound as it is. Let's not overdo it. And let's lower by two clicks the rebound at the front. So, now, here's the situation with the dampers. If you do small clicks, then they act from where you are, then they act pretty much as we know the dampers. So, a little bit softer rebound at the front, one click or two clicks, it will probably give some front end grip, mechanical grip, and rotate the car at the exit, okay? As we know, as usual. But if you exaggerate with the bumpers, so let's, for example, say that we go up to 15, then you might experience the exact opposite. Why is that? Because by making the dampers very stiff, you control the ride height of the car because the dampers are really stiff, which means that at, at very high rebound stiffness like that, when we go to the accelerator, the front end of the car, instead of lifting, it will stay fixed because the damper will, you know, control it and fix it, which means that it will ge generate more downforce and you're going to have more front aero downforce to deal with the very fast uh, front bends. Um, is this the case? I don't know. We will try this way and the other way. For now, we were at around 10 here, so I will try just 8. So just two clicks down and see if this improves. And then we can do the other way around. So big differences in the clicks of the rebounds affect the aerodynamics, okay? Small differences in the clicks of the rebounds affect the mechanical Greek, uh, grip and weight transfer. Uh, so let's see. Uh, bumps, uh, so Alexander Kramarski says again, uh, but bump stops also increase tire wearing. This is true. This is why usually we don't use bump stops at the rear but we are forced to use bump stops at the front because we need to control the front ride height to control the pitch sensitivity. All those cars use, depending on the car, quite a bit of front bump stops. Some of them a little bit less. You might be at 10, you might be at 15, but generally you need quite a bit of supportive front end to control the pitch sensitivity. Uh, Shiny Volpix asks, very soft setups with spring and arb uh, tend to use very high damping to offset for the right height changes. Is that a good thing? Uh, it can work. Uh, keep in mind always one thing. Uh, I've had many people saying, oh, but, you know, we have very, I, I've put the uh, wheel rate very soft and the car still reacts properly. Well, the wheel rates range we have here are taken from the real car's technical manual. Okay, so the range that they give in springs and wheel rates is not, you know, okay, let's give them the softest spring and the stiffest spring. No, they give you wheel rates into a range that they know it can work. So it's not impossible to have the car set it up like this. Minimum wheel rate doesn't mean anything. It's still very stiff especially for the Porsche. I mean, you still have 100,000 meters, meters. So it's still very stiff. It's a range that they know it works. So don't be, you know, afraid uh, to, to, to use, uh, I don't even remember what was the spring rate here. I think 141. I hope so. Uh, so don't, don't be afraid to, to use minimum or maximum. It's still a range that, that works, okay? All right, so... Let's do this last final try. Whoops. What? <laughs> Now we have to be careful because that uh, front splitter might have created extra pitch sensitivity which we didn't want so let's see
Uh, not that bad, and the exit seems better. Ooh, that was too much of a curb there. The slow turns, the turning was much better. Have to be smooth into that turn. It seems that that turn lacks grip, so I have to be smooth with the accelerator. Oh, some extra rotation. Wobbly head. <laughs> power! Give me power. Nice here. Whoa, extra rotation. Doesn't seem to be much faster though, still. But second lap, so let's wait. Nice. Better. Ah, too much rotation. Improved. Not by much, but... Better again. Oh, that was that was bad. Ha, 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 boom. It's better. Hello, Henrik. Herrick. Herrick. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I want some extra thing. I want. Uh, I'm a little bit of afraid of you know pushing the car, so I would like something different. So, boo, 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 boo. maybe it's too much splitter. Maybe it's too much splitter. So maybe we can do. We can go down one here, and maybe we could do something different. Um. I don't know what to do, to be honest. Or I could leave the splitter and try to, to control a little bit. Hmm. No, actually, yes, splitter three. And we had some over rotation at the exit this time. So maybe we can go down one or two clicks on the preload. Fine tuning now, fine tuning to help with controlling the exit and have a better rotation at the costing when we're doing nothing okay uh true the pressures we have to fix the pressures they seem to be good but uh, i'm not sure about that yeah we have to fix the pressure so let me do three or four laps like that see how the pressures react and then go in and correct the pressures so let's go Oh no, come on, no pressure drinks. <laughs> okay, let's do 
two or three laps and correct the pressures. Oh, that's nice here. Ha, <laughs> turn on lights. <laughs> so dark already. Yes, 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 yes. I will turn on lights. Here you are. Oh, that's very nice. Also over the curbs. Oops, that was too optimistic. Nazdrovie, hello. I, I know that. <laughs> I'm a man of the world. What can you do? <laughs> Whoa, don't deck. Ah, that inner curb killed me. Jesus, I don't know what happened. The car just, you know, went straight all alone. Very nice exit. Yeah. Oh, that's me. That's bad. That's bad on me. Oh my God. The Porsche is, I mean, that sometimes it just bites you so hard. You have to be so concentrated. A little bit of understeer here, but I can deal with that. Okay, so pressures have issues, which is a good thing. It means we can go faster. 27.2 here. Reading the chat. All right, so let's go inside and uh, one, two, three, four. Yeah, four. I think it's good. 27. Everything is great. Let's save this setup because I don't know even how to call it, but uh, I don't know. So, uh, Porsche. Evo Zandvoort uh, race, something like this, at 22 degrees. Actually, 22. Uh. Okay, save this. Okay. Okay, last uh, last try. Let's see if we can see a 35, maybe. Who knows? Uh, last try and uh, hmm, yeah. Let's go.
<laughs> Let's do a last try here, see if we like it, save it, and then maybe do some questions and answers. If you guys are still alive. And then we'll see. That was nice here. Yeah, absolutely. The setup goes right into the uh, into the folder. Nice. Good. Ah, bad exit. Masking too much on that corner. Have to take it better. Oh, it's all oh, this is oh so good. Oh, it was almost perfect. there I had to rotate the car to make the turn I have now 27.8 of pressure I don't get this Seven point seven. Bad again. Hmm. That was perfect. Much better than before. Ah, uh, stupid turn. Come on. Ah. <laughs> uh getting tired probably but you can see that you know the 35 is here um let's see one click less here too much i don't know why probably we've lost some pressure before because it doesn't make sense um pop, 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 pop. you know what i'll try again the split route five we have the less reload here you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna just one click of brake bias to help me not go into too much oversteer at turn in because of the fraud splitter and that's it i'm not touching anything else if you see me touching stuff kill me 
they opened the racetrack at 10.30 p.m. for me alone because dev hacks, dev power. <laughs> I'm more confident the car is starting to make mistakes, that's true. Uh, it's also three hours that I'm talking, you know, <laughs> and driving, which means that I'm starting also to be a little bit too tired to do things properly. That feels nice. <laughs> I'm not good at driving with uh, too much rear brake bias. I'm not so good. I know that you can gain, but uh, it's not my style of driving. <laughs> okay, let's try. Thanks, Johan, for the follow. Come on. Push. Nice. Come on. That's good. That's good. We have another best lap, 36.2, I'd take it. Ah, uh, my bad. See, it's uh, driver errors now. I'll take it for tonight, 36.2, what do you guys say? I think I can take it. I think I can take it. So that goes not bad at all. Let's save this setup, I think it's a pretty good setup. So let's call it number two. For whatever stupid reason, what am I doing? I don't know. Number two. And save it. All right. Okay, so we have two setups to send you guys. I hope you will enjoy them. Um, decent. <laughs> Let's go to the drive here. Where is it? Here. 
And what do we have here? We have, uh, right, we have, um, what is that? Uh, Porsche line. Yeah, let's do like that. Come on, one by one, two, GT, three, R. Right, here it is. And then, where's the go here documents so the course of the vision uh setups setups pop, pop, pop. at the end we have for this one and we go to the soundboard and we have those two nice little setups like that uh maybe we can also save the replay for the people that might want to have a look yes we can save the replay it's always a very nice thing to have a look. So, uh, replay. Replay saved. Forcer. That's it. Nice. Okay. So, I guess we have everything. That looks pretty nice. So, let's have a look at that. And... Uh, Questions and answers, guys, if you're still alive, I mean, we were 540 people at the chat now, we have remained 322, which is still an incredible amount at 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so, I don't know if we can, you know, answer a couple of questions and uh, then call it a day and have some sleep, finally. So, let me have it. Questions? Uh, coconuts, uh, since the last update, no, we didn't do anything, but I know there have been many Windows uh, updates that have, I'm not saying worse and things, but they have created strange situations with drivers, with uh, configurations. So I advise you to check all your drivers, configurations, uh, you know, video card, uh, all that stuff. Uh, some guys had to reinstall their uh, CPU and chipset uh, drivers and some guys reported that they had to redo from scratch or even, you know, eliminate the documents as a Corsa folder and redo the uh, graphic uh, options because they have been resetted for whatever reason. So check that, check if, you know, the documents folder, the documents as a Corsa Competizione folder is uh, read and write permissions uh, and try again the exhaust getting more and more red yes we can do that yeah actually that's a great idea so lo look at the exhaust right now look at that and uh, we'll see at the uh, oh sparks <laughs> and uh, we'll see at the you, you see now the the exhaust is you know just red at the inside of the tips, just the tip, <laughs> and you will see at the straights how it gets more red. Well, the front splitter acts, you know, as a wing at the front. The higher the number, the extra downforce it generate and a little bit of uh, uh, drag. Uh, it also will raise it to be the pitch sensitivity because obviously we're talking about the front splitter. So, here's how it is. Uh, how brake ducts works. Mm, higher number, your brakes getting cooler and the temperature of the brakes influence also the temperature of the tires. Lower brake ducts, your temperature uh, of the brakes get hotter and also make the tires hotter. Uh, watch out because if you use too low brake ducts, uh, 
the hotter the, the brakes, the more they worn out sooner. So let's have a look at the uh, uh, at the uh, exhausts now. You see, they become more and more red. Can you see that? At the end of the straight, it's more red than, than before. Look at that now. It doesn't show so much right now. You need to have even, you know, uh, let's see, maybe at the end of the laps, maybe here. Yeah. Let's have a look. Yeah, you see how it's red now. Uh, Dark Knight, you can try the setup in different circuits. Uh, circuits like Barcelona or Brands Hats might work better with uh, the setup from uh, Zandvoort as they are, you know, similar tracks. Look how, look how red the uh, exhausts are right now. Look at that. You see? So much more red and glow. And now the car becomes, you know, when it when I will start here at the low part look at that you see they, they become less red now you see they go down less and less red and now they accelerate again they get hotter and hotter and hotter and more red more red like this Maybe we can show the exhaust uh, another time during the night. It would be nicer. Okay, so other question. The engine power settings, different to other cars. Uh, yes, we have the um, dev blog where we have all the list of all the cars uh, with all the IQ settings. So if you go in the dev blog, if one guy of the modders uh, in the chat can post the link. Uh, and you can find the link in the description, actually. The, in the description of this video, you can find the link to the dev blogs inside there. You will find the uh, Echo Maps uh, blog post, and we have the list of all the Echoes for all the cars. Uh, Softer, Clement, Brody, you have blistering at uh, the Nurburgring. It's a little bit strange that you have blistering at the Nurburgring, but try to use um, softer dumping and softer wheel rates. Matt Vicens asks uh, ACC on console, what are my thoughts on the 30 frame rate cap and will the physics still feel the same? Uh, well, here's my thought about the console and I'm very serious about it. Now, we all know that 30 frames per second is a compromise and we're not happy about that, it would have been much, much better to have 60 frames per second or even 100 frames per second, obviously, obviously. But, I've tried it, 30 frames per second, it's still good and, uh, you know, you can drive it much more smooth than, you know, uh, uh, PC, 30 frames per second. As we know, uh, the consoles are optimized for 30 or 60 frames per second, so the whole thing is much smoother. I would suggest eliminate the steering wheel animation so that you don't have some graphic lag from the 30 frames per second you don't need to see it because you have your own steering wheel in front of you and uh, once you do that there's no real input lag and the most important thing is in my very very humble opinion your opinion might be different i respect it but please allow me to say this assetto corso competizione is on console and modesty apart I think it's the first time that such an advanced simulator with the same physics goes into the console. We are talking about true 100% hardcore simulation on the console. Never happened before. There is nothing like it on the console. I mean, there are so many people saying that the Seto Corsa Competition is probably the best GT3 simulation 
uh, right now on PC. Uh, I'm not objective. I would say yes, of course, but I'm not objective, so I won't say that. But I would say that it's certainly top stuff, okay, in terms of physics. Up there with everybody. We aren't afraid of anybody in terms of physics in GT3 cars. And it is now on the console. Never before in the history of consoles we had such an advanced simulator physics uh, on the consoles uh, for the G3 cars. And the same sound is on the console. And honestly, I truly believe we have the best sound in the industry, bar none, on the G3 cars, anywhere in the PC. And now the console users can finally have such a rich sound experience. I mean, there is nothing out there. I mean, just listen to to those engines. It's it's unbelievable. Okay, uh, so the the sound is exactly the same. The detail of the models is the same. Sure, we don't have the same effects. We don't have the same uh, texture resolution, but the detail of the models is amazing. And we've talked about that at the start of. Uh, of our stream here, I've shown you the model is unbelievably good and detailed and, and uh, so many small things. Um, the, the, the tracks are all laser scanned, there is incredible precision to the tracks. Uh, incredible 24 hours, because first to say that Gran Turismo has amazing graphics, but there is always a but. The conditions of the lighting are fixed. And that big is a big difference, a big difference, because you can pre-render the shadows. And the shadows are very heavy on the hardware. While in our situation, the shadows are all dynamic and they change with 24 hours of the day uh, and, and sun and uh, the moon and everything, and even the lights of, of the cars. And then we have full weather simulation, dynamic rains, puddles, dry line, everything works. Nothing has been, you know, cut out. So all we did is obviously we limited the textures, we limited uh, some details, uh, we tried our best, 30 frames per second, that's how it is. But I believe that for the true lovers of simulation, uh, that for whatever reason, they prefer the console, it's the first time that they have the opportunity to have a truly, truly next level, next generation hardcore simulation on the console. And we're talking about the old consoles here. And I think that's a great thing. I mean, it might sound like marketing, but I think I'm, I'm talking about facts, you know? So that's the that's situation. Still 20 opponents, not bad at all. I mean, uh, it's not like 16 that we had with the Seto Corsa 1. So even that is better. So yeah, that's uh, that's that's how I see the whole thing. I think it's uh, really really good if you are really if you really care about you know how uh, proper racing simulator and driving. Uh, okay, w w just a moment, guys. Too many questions. Um. Uh, Moreno Sartor says, how, how about the private lobbies? When they will come? Any idea from you guys? What I can tell you, because I don't know the specifics and details, uh, the fact and the answer we give and it is official is that the game doesn't have at lunch, mark my words, doesn't have at lunch private lobbies. There are many reasons of that. Uh, I cannot go into details why and how and what, but at lunch we don't have private lobbies. So, right? So, I wouldn't worry too much. Just be patient. Um, Tire pressures, uh, approach applies to the Pirelli tires, or this pressure theory applies to all kinds of tires. It applies to all kinds of tires. Obviously, different tires uh, might, you know, uh, require different tire pressures, uh, but all tires have their correct range of tire pressures. Uh, 
if you know, obviously each simulator is different. Uh, sometimes in the past uh, we had some older simulators that you know the lower the tire pressure the better it was always but that's not the case in reality in reality you have to be very very uh, precise and uh, correct with tire pressures and you know that from real life I mean you, you've seen real races uh, which by the way once this whole COVID pandemic situation city situation goes away uh, I highly highly recommend to go and visit uh, GT3 SRO uh, race usually uh, on all races the uh, ticket is extremely cheap and affordable it's like 10 euros or 15 euros something like that and you have access to the paddock and what you will see always is you know the car comes in and everybody jumps into the tires and let's measure the pressures adjust the pressures chains go out again everybody is like number one thing to do is pressure why because the whole thing that the car does is the footprint which is big like that that's the whole footprint of four stupid tires with this asphalt you have 1500 kilos of cars with 600 extra kilos of downforce and all the grip they have is from four footprints the size of more or less this okay so that footprint depends on the pressure if the pressure is correct the footprint is bigger if the pressure is wrong the footprint is smaller so pressure is absolute number one thing uh, what else we have uh, sorry missing so many stuff <laughs> cosplay I would get the game. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, All right, twenty. Yeah, I mean, twenty-four euros, tw twenty-five euros for the whole weekend. Saturday, Sunday, Friday is free. You get in, you talk with the drivers if you have, you, you can talk with the engineers. I mean, obviously, you're disturbing sometimes, but who cares? I mean, they are there for you. And at some point, they even let you go into the pit lane uh, if you go Saturday or Friday when they're doing, you know, the tests. It's amazing. The only race that costs a lot is the, the spa, but it's 24 hours and, you know, it's famous. So the ticket is like 50 euros, something like that. But still, I mean, you can go just on Sunday and have a great time and the ticket is amazingly affordable. And the races are really, really cool. And the noise, I mean, it's even better. <laughs> what can I say? Uh, there is dirt on the white shield, but you have to do uh, lots of laps and you have uh, and dirt accumulates even uh, faster if you go outside you know and you get lots of dirt uh, raised up from from the tires from outside the asphalt if you go to the dirt or the sun uh, the white screen gets dirtier um, Alexander, that's true. I don't know about that, uh, El Transa. Not my part, so I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Okay, traction control one and traction control two. Let's do this so we can explain it and maybe, you know, cut it and showcase to, to the people in a uh, too long didn't watch video. So, okay. How. So, some cars have um, traction control one and traction control two. Okay. Now, cars that have just traction control one doesn't mean that they don't do the same thing, but it is built in what I'm about to explain into traction control one. So each level of traction control one has different things happening. Okay. Now, traction control two and one. So some cars, starting with the Ferrari, that was the first car that made this has those two traction controls. So what they do, 
Well, the first thing they do is traction control one um, it dictates when the traction control will engage to control the power of the engine. Okay? So, for example, listen to the sound. Okay? So, with traction control low, like traction control one low, we go into the turn, we go to the accelerator and oversteer like this. Okay? Why? Because traction control level, traction control one level low, it lets the rear tire spin before engage. Okay? So, again, oversteer like this. Okay? Now, if I raise a lot the traction control 1 to something like 11, so full, you will hear the engine cutting a lot, like tak 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 tak, like rah, 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 rah. So let's do that. So I will go into oversteer, full full acceleration. Listen. Okay, let's try to a uh, slower gear and turn. And of course, the the car doesn't accelerate. You don't have any wheel spin, you don't have oversteer, but listen to that. Okay, listen again. And you can also watch the rev limiter that goes like that because it cuts, okay? It, it, the engine cuts the, the whole ignition uh, to try to limit the... Um, uh, the power on the wheels. Look at that. Even in first gear and the car doesn't accelerate. Okay, so traction control one is when uh, the traction control will engage and cut the power. So depending on how much the tires are spinning, the traction control will decide to uh, engage sooner. So when or later. Okay, so it will either let the wheel spin a lot or not at all. That's traction control one. So traction control one tries to understand when to engage, when to engage. Now traction control two is a little bit different. It follows traction control one. So at some point traction control one says, okay, engage. This is the time, this is the when, engage. Okay, traction control two says, okay, I'm engaging but by how much I will limit the power. So lower level of traction control 2 means that I will engage, but I will let some power to go through the wheels anyway and permit some spinning. Well, traction control 2 higher level, it means that I will engage more. So traction, again, traction control 1 is when the traction control will engage, Traction control two is how much the traction control will engage. And the two things are separate like that. So let's hear what traction control two does. So let's put traction control one to a low level, like two, okay. And raise the traction control two. Oops, sorry, that was the uh, ABS. And uh, raise the traction control two to something like five, okay. Right. So we know that with traction control one, normally traction control one at level one, we have lots of power oversteer. But now we have traction control one at level one and traction control two at level five. Okay, let's see. Listen to the engine. As you can see, I don't have any oversteer, but the engine doesn't really cut. Okay, some, some cut now, some oversteer now, but listen again and watch. You see how smooth the oversteer was? Try this again.
look how smooth over still we have again once more we even have some understeer you see now why is that because right now traction control one says okay let's wait a bit that the car starts to slide and then traction control says okay it's sliding but i will cut power a lot okay because i'm at level five so it cuts the power but doesn't cut it with the ignition it it's like you know it takes the advance of of the engine back and so it's like the engine has less power it doesn't cut cylinders but it has less power now let's put traction control 2 at something lower like 1 okay and let's put the traction control 1 at 3 and see I don't know if you already see what happened here and again here so what happens now is that traction control 1 says oh wait a minute we have slide let's start cutting okay sooner because we are at level 3 but traction control 2 says okay we start cut but I will cut just a little bit not too much as as little as I can so we still have some you see we still have some extra slippers look at that you see it's very smooth you see look at that it rotates alone so this is what happens traction control one decides when the traction control will engage traction control two decides how much the traction control will engage okay so this is how it works now as i said in cars that have just one level of traction that, that they have just traction control one okay it still happens the same thing but the two things are already implemented in each level that you move around okay so you move you put the traction control one at level two it you know has different uh, values inside level two to have both things at the same time um, obviously when you have two traction controls you have the driver has you know more uh, possibilities to tune the car around and the behavior and that obviously changes the things um, last thing I want to tell you is that it's always a good way to use the two traction controls at similar levels so let's say you use traction control one at level three traction control two at level three if you want something different take the traction control two and move it by one click up or one click down don't create situations extreme situations like we had before like you know traction control one at one and traction control two at five this creates confusion you won't understand exactly what's happening it's not so good also in real life uh they always you know advise you go together you know same levels to both traction control and then play one click up one click down between them not uh, at maximum two clicks but not much more than that okay so that's it and uh and that's it with for the traction control what else can i say i think that's enough Let's see it's, if it's hot enough to see our uh, rear uh, exhaust. Look at how red it is right now. No worries, guys. That's why we do. Look, look how red the <laughs> the exhaust is right now. That it is, you know, later in the night. Let's see if we have a. Have a go at the. Ah, I was going slow. Maybe here. Two times out of two, I was going slow at the straight line. Anyway. All right, so 
Silvio, non stiamo più aggiornando la sottocorsa 1, mi spiace, è vecchio di tanti anni. Uh, no, Shiny Volpix, you can have either way, it's the same. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, Troll Turismo, I really, really recommend to do this, to follow a car with the lights, you know, switch off, it's, it's an experience, it's an experience. Okay, guys, I think uh, it's already one o'clock, uh, half past one o'clock. <laughs> uh, and, uh, well, because we, we did quite of a, of a live stream and I finished my water here. Uh, so I think it's enough for, for tonight. And uh, I, I hope that you enjoyed it. It's uh, 1.30 right now in Italy <laughs> all right oh yeah in VR must be amazing <laughs> I mean look at that look how red it is <laughs> okay guys Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, remember, tell your friends. I uh, hope we had a great time. I certainly enjoyed it a lot. I think it was a pretty good uh, live stream again. And um, now, obviously, this is only for the guys that are here. From next week, I am going to prepare an eight hour uh, endurance race with Driver Swap uh, in an Italian championship. So I'm going to do a live stream in Italian. Uh, I will try to also do a live stream uh, in English. I don't know which days of the week, but we'll see. Uh, but uh, I'm going to do, you know, the live stream of the preparation uh, and practice uh, in Italian and the eight hours in Italian. Sorry about that, but we also have to, you know, uh, do some live streams for our Italian friends that they ask so many times for, for this. And uh, right, but we, we will still do... Um, obviously uh, English uh, live streams and after the eight hours that I think it's at the uh, 5th of July Saturday uh, eight hours uh, and do endurance racing uh, after that we're gonna do obviously some uh, aftermath with you know different cars and uh, at the same time it's gonna be at spa eight hours 5th of July all right <laughs> okay okay guys thank you so much Thank you for, you know, keeping up with me this late night and uh, see you next.